Hello, everybody. This is my 18th uh, session of Arbitration Bootcamp, um, and it is my last one until September. So I'm going to take a, a, a summer break. The next one will be on September the 19th. Um, I'd love if any of you has a topic on what you'd like to hear about in the fall, uh, please do send me an email. Uh, that will provide me with some inspiration. Uh, for those of you who haven't tuned in before, I'm Lisa Monroe. I'm a partner at Learners and uh, an arbitrator at Arbitration Place. I am the writer and editor uh, of Arbitration Matters, www.arbitrationmatters.com. C.com. Um, and, and that website provides summaries of recent cases that have been uh, distributed and, and issued by uh, courts across Canada. And these summaries are, are also uh, providing commentary um, in short bites. If you'd like to get those cases as they are released in summary form, uh, you can subscribe for free on my website and you'll get uh, a bunch of cases every second week. You can also catch up on other arbitration boot camp webinars that you've missed. Once this session is done, you'll get a recording of it. You'll also get a list from me of all of the uh, arbitration boot camps from uh, history, and you can tune in on any of them if the topics uh, are of interest to you. The purpose of these, these webinars is to provide practical advice on arbitration issues, which I think and, and I certainly thought when I started out was difficult to come by. A lot of case law and academic information is out there, but but practical advice on how to use the act and uh, the institutional rules is in short supply. I've got my Q&A box open. If you have any questions, please do put them into the Q&A box. I'll try to reach them as I uh, give my remarks, but if not, I'll, I'll reach them at the end. I'll get you out in an hour as promised. Uh, this, this session actually has a lot of content, so I'm gonna have to zoom along, um, but I will have you out by one. So the topic of today's uh, session is the role of courts in arbitration. And all of my previous arbitration boot camps have focused on the role of arbitrations in, as a dispute resolution process, which in many ways uh, is, in my view, superior to the courts, but it is separate from the courts and very different in many ways. And it's a very attractive option, in my view, uh, because of the, the uh, backlogs in the court system. So what, what this session is going to do is slightly different, which is to talk about how you can get court intervention if you want it or if you need it. So essentially, the courts have a role in assisting and supervising and supporting arbitration. How? For example, when parties haven't addressed an important issue in their arbitra arbitration agreement, such as what to do if they haven't agreed on an, an arbitrator such as when a party against whom an award has been made refuses to comply with that award, such as where one of the parties or both of the parties need relief that will affect third parties to the arbitration and who are not subject to the arbitrator's jurisdiction. So essentially, the courts are there to fill in where the arbitrator lacks jurisdiction, or in some cases, to provide a limited review of a decision or award of an arbitrator. So for the most part today, I'm going to be talking about the seat of the arbitration and, and the law from the perspective of the, the, the role of the courts at the seat of the arbitration, and in particular, um, the Ontario legislation. I'm going to focus on that because it's what I'm most familiar with, but also because the legislation is very similar to uh, the legislation in other provinces like uh, Alberta, Manitoba. BC is a little bit different uh, and, and has some very important differences. And where I can, I'm going to highlight some of the difference in, differences in that legislation. But I'm also going to try to um, deal with a few points of interest in international arbitration under the, the model law. So, so the reason the, the seat 
uh, of the arbitration is important is it determines which legislation applies, of course. And it's a fundamental issue, although courts often get confused about this and parties do as well. So so what is the suit, the seat? Just a quick summary. If you if you'd like to know to know more about the concept of seat, you can go back to my arbitration boot camp uh, session 10, which is one of the issues I talk about in that session called 10 Common Mistakes in Arbitration. But just for a, a brief refresher, it is essentially the legal place of the arbitration and determines which court has this, this support or supervisory jurisdiction to, to assist in the arbitration and to step in, as I've suggested it can do. And it may be different from the law, the substantive law of the contract, contract, and the seat law may be different from the venue where the hearing takes place. The, the actual seat is less important from a tactical or strategic perspective where it is in Canada, because for the most part, the legislation is the same or similar. But most importantly, the courts of Canada, guided by the Supreme Court of Canada, are very supportive of arbitration. And so the party's expectations about what they think arbitration will provide to them are largely met because of that court supervision. There are similar principles that apply, and generally the case law across the country has some application in each jurisdiction. But that is not the case in international arbitration, and one of the decisions that parties make when they're either um, choosing a seat in their contract where they've got their arbitration agreement or later when they're beginning an arbitration is which seat will be the most user-friendly seat. Many parties will want a seat that is a neutral seat in the sense that it doesn't give either party the home advantage of understanding the courts. But the choice of seat is also important to ensure that the courts in that jurisdiction are supportive of arbitration and will be there um, if the parties parties need them. So the 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 Issues that I'm going to deal with and the areas that I'm going to deal with today are just a, a, a little bit of a soupçon of the, the assistance that courts can provide. But, but in any case, as I always say, uh, take a look at the legislation, take a look at the rules, which have some application about the, uh, about the role courts can play, and of course also the, the uh, arbitration clause. And I say read the rules and read the legislation as a very obvious proposition, but I find that whenever I look at those when I, when I start a case, I always see something in there that I didn't see before. So it's absolutely essential to start, to start there. So the most important place to start this discussion is that the court involvement is limited by statute. And that limitation is expressly stated. And what that means is that the court does not have inherent jurisdiction over our arbitrations. So for example, uh, section six of the Ontario Arbitrations Act says quite simply, no court shall intervene in matters governed by this act except for the following purposes, to assist the conduct of arbitrations, to ensure that arbitrations are conducted in accordance with arbitration agreements, to prevent unequal or unfair treatment of parties to an arbitration, uh, and to enforce awards. The Uncitral model law is a little bit more general, and it says in matters governed by this law, no court shall intervene except where so provided in this law. And as a fact, the areas that the model law per permits court intervention are very similar and overlap to a large extent uh, with those set out in the domestic legislation. It's very clear that the role of the courts is to support and supervise. And of course, the court's supervision is limited to the place of arbitration within that court's jurisdiction. And the reason for that is the courts really have no interest in an arbitration taking out, outside, uh, taking place outside its own jurisdiction. And of course, the exception is, and the only exception that I can think of at the moment is where there is an application to enforce an award, which may have been granted in another place, um, and there may be assets in the jurisdiction of the party which has refused to comply with the order in the court, for example, Ontario that I'm talking about, which would which would mean that the place that the the order would be enforced is the, is the place where those assets are located. So so other than that, the the court with the uh, jurisdiction is is in the place of the arbitration. 
There are four main policy reasons for courts to intervene in arbitration. The first is party autonomy. There is no interference by the courts unless it is necessary. This is a recognition that the parties have a right to opt out of the court process and to have a private dispute resolution process. They have a right to decide what that looks like and where there is, uh, where there is um, expression in the arbitration agreement about what the parties are looking for in their arbitration, that is an expression of party autonomy. And only where the statute gives the court jurisdiction can it intervene. So that's an, a respect for party autonomy. Another policy reason is finality. One of the primary motivators for most parties to embark upon arbitration is to limit the rights of court intervention. So for example, in domestic arbitration, there is a limit on parties' appeal rights and parties can actually opt out of appeal rights altogether. Another example of party autonomy, but it also uh, overlaps with the finality concept. And in international arbitration, a set-aside application is the only recourse against an award. And I'll, as I'll discuss briefly uh, in, in a moment, the set-aside provision is there to protect unfairness in process, essentially, and not it, it is not a review of the merits of the case. Again, this is consistent with the party's requirement or, or agreement for finality. Another important role of the courts is to ensure fairness. Because arbitration is an alternative to court proceedings for many reasons, such as privacy, confidentiality, choosing a decision maker with specialized knowledge, buying into the concept of case management and a flexible process, the parties are still entitled to expect a fair procedure. And the parties cannot opt out of fairness. So despite the concept of party autonomy, parties may not opt out of a fair process. And in fact, can complain if the process is not fair by seeking to set aside the award. The fourth policy reason for court intervention is efficiency. Arbitrations are undoubtedly faster than court proceedings if that's what the parties want. It offers effective case management and it's often chosen as an alternative to court proceedings because of the court backlog. The opportunity for parties to take arbitration to court are limited for efficiency reasons because the court often slows down the process provides opportunities for tactical delays, uh, sometimes in the middle of an arbitration. And even when there is an appeal of an interlocutory ruling that must go to the courts, uh, uh, some of the provisions in the act stipulate quite clearly that the arbitration may proceed if that's what the tribunal orders, notwithstanding that one or both of the parties are taking an off ramp uh, to the courts for decision of a particular matter. So despite the right for a private dispute resolution process, there are a, a, a surprising number of opportunities for courts to intervene. And all of them are driven by these policy reasons. Many of them are rarely invoked, which is a good thing, which means they're there essentially as, as a safety net. Um, and the four policy rationales that I've talked about are not really watertight compartments. So you can see a number of the um, provisions that I've already talked about sit in a number uh, more than one category. I think it's worth mentioning that the BC Act, uh, which is uh, it, the domestic act, which was enacted later than the arbitration uh, acts and the other legislation in the other provinces, contains a lot of, uh, I think, progressive ideas about and provisions about arbitration. And it has a specific provision, section 22, which it imposes upon the parties a duty to do all things necessary for the just, speedy, and economical determination of these proceedings in accordance with the agreement of the parties and the orders and directions of the arbitra arbitral tribunal. So that essentially captures the policy rationales that I've just uh, referred to a few moments ago. We don't know, or I don't know, um, how that 
section has been interpreted with respect to, uh, for example, cost consequences for the failure of a party to uh, comply with that duty. And it certainly is a provision that can be used to advantage uh, by the party who is complaining about another party's failure to comply with that provision uh, by uh, accusing that party of uh, tactical delays, which of course then can be put before the arbitrator for uh, resolution. So I just want to say another word about a uh, party autonomy because the act allows court intervention in a limited number of circumstances, but the parties can, by agreement, further limit the resource to the court, except in a limited number of, of circumstances. So they can actually contract out of some of the provisions that provide for court intervention. For example, their arbitration agreement can specifically state that there is no injunctive relief that can be sought uh, before the courts. Otherwise, the arbitral tribunal or if the arbitral tribunal has not been constituted an emergency arbitrator um, under various institutional rules can be, uh, uh, can be appointed to deal with those, those issues. Again, this is, a, this is an exercise of party autonomy that allows parties to opt out of certain provisions in the legislation. So in Ontario, where, uh, where parties uh, wish to opt out of or contract out of certain provisions in the arbitration agreement, they cannot do so with respect to a few ideas. So first of all, the Scott, a Scott and Avery clause, parties cannot opt out of that provision. That is an agreement to arbitrate before a matter is can go to court. And the way the Scott and Avery clause is interpreted is that is it is a condition precedent to court, court action. Parties cannot opt out of that provision. They cannot opt out of the entitlement to be treated equally and fairly. Interesting, under the BC Act, that provision relates to a requirement to treat parties fairly only, not necessarily equally. Extension of time limits. Parties may opt out of statutory extension of time limits, but not the time limit that relates to uh, delivery of an award, an application to extend the time for delivery of uh, an award after that time has expired. Applications to set aside an award. Parties cannot opt out of that entitlement. Declaration of invalidity of an arbitration. At any time, uh, by way of application, a party who has not participated in the arbitration uh, may seek to have the arbitration declared invalid for a whole bunch of reasons, including the, one of the parties entered into the agreement uh, while under incapacity, the arbitration agreement was invalid, it, it's, it, uh, and so on. The parties cannot opt out of the right to have the award enforced by a court. And all of these exceptions to court's right to intervene, um, it, 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 to parties' rights to opt out of a court's right to intervene are consistent with the, the policy rationales that I've already referred to, and in particular, the policy rationale. Another comment about the role of arbitral institutes in all of this, and particularly as it relates to party autonomy. The parties may contract out of some of the provisions of the Act by agreeing upon institutional rules. Again, this is an exercise of party autonomy, and in some circumstances, the institution will play a role that would, is otherwise reserved, reserved for the court. So a good example of that is where the parties cannot agree upon the choice of arbitrator. The institutions provide a process to allow that to happen without the necessity of going to court. And the real advantages of that are clear, most significantly, the, uh, the maintenance of uh, confidentiality and privacy uh, of the dispute. There, there are often um, interim measures provisions in the rules, and in some cases, the test for when interim measures may be ordered is different from the court test for an interim injunction. And that is, of course, a significant issue that parties should consider when they decide whether they want uh, to adopt uh, a certain institution's rules or deal with it in their uh, arbitration agreement. 
Another uh, significant difference in some of the institutions is the process for applications to have a, an arbitrator removed on the basis of, of bias. The court process is that the, the challenge goes first to the arbitrator, and if one of the parties objects to that decision, it goes to the court. In some of the institutions, the, ar the challenge goes first to the institution, and in some cases, the arbitrator isn't even aware that a challenge has been made, uh, and, and sometimes it goes to the, to the arbitrator and then to the institution, which is a similar process for uh, the court process. So again, very important issues to consider at the outset of the arbitration, particularly if privacy and confidentiality is critical. So I've identified a number of places uh, in the legislation where uh, court interference is permitted. Uh, determination of a question of law, um, termination of an arbitrator's mandate or removal of an arbitrator. This is also something that, that uh, many institutions provide for. And, and the interesting uh, part of that is if there are concerns uh, about, even from a tribunal, about one of the members of the tribunal, it is possible to get uh, intervention or at least assistance from the uh, institution consolidation of arbitrations, and I'm going to deal with that in a moment, um, appeals, that sort of thing, Evident declaration of invalidity of the arbitration. There are there There's a, a longer list, but uh, I've identified some of the, the key ones. There is another important issue in all of this, um, considering the role of the, uh, the court in arbitrations, and that is what role do they play in arbitration agreements, and particularly when there's been a breach of the arbitration agreement. And I've talked throughout this, this webinar series about the arbitration agreement is essentially a contract, and a number and most contract principles apply to it, but there are also some additional arbitration-related concepts that apply. And, and this, is, this is one example. If there is a breach by one party of the arbitration agreement, the non-breaching party has two options. And this usually occurs at the beginning of the arbitration and one party doesn't want to participate in the process. The non-breaching party can accept the repudiation and sue in the courts on the basis that the other party uh, is, is not buying into the arbitration concept and the non-breaching party is content that the matter proceed in the courts notwithstanding what the arbitration agreement says. The breaching party or the alleged breaching party then has the choice to agree to have the dispute proceed in the courts or to bring a, a, an, uh, an application to stay the court action on the basis that the, the matter really must be determined in arbitration in accordance with the party's arbitration agreement. The alternative of the non-breaching party is to simply proceed with the arbitration on the basis that the parties agree to arbitrate, the non-breaching party wishes to arbitrate and not go to court, and it will proceed with the arbitration by appointing an arbitrator. There may be a, a, a requirement for assistance in that regard, but proceeding with the ar arbitration. And unlike court proceedings, the while the breaching party is entitled to notice of what's taking place throughout the arbitration, there's no such thing as uh, um, an application for default judgment or an, uh, an order of that nature, which we do see in court proceedings. So the the non-breaching, non-participating, the non-participating alleged breaching party must be provided with notice of the continuation of the arbitration, and in most cases, the, that once the breaching party understands that they do participate because there is a possibility that an award can be granted even without uh, the participation of that, that party. One of the reasons this, this is an important consideration is it avoids having a non-cooperating party avoid having to have the dispute resolved at all, either in court or by arbitration. One party does have the ability to force the dispute to be resolved in one uh, forum or another. 
So I'd like to actually review the specific provisions in the legislation that demonstrate uh, the, the observance of these four policy rationales that I've talked about. And I'm not going to cover everything today. And one of the concerns I have is that if I go through this uh, quickly, uh, you're going to feel like you're caught in traffic on the 401 with the cards speaking by and you can't, you can't, um, you can't keep up. So I'm going to try to keep it at a general level, but just give you a sense of the kinds of um, interventions or assistance the court the court can provide. There's also a lot of nuggets in the act and in the rules. Um, so if this has piqued your interest, and in particular, if you're involved, involved in an arbitration uh, right now, and, and you're starting to think that you may need court assistance, please do go back to the legislation or the rules of the institution, because there may be something uh, there there to, to assist you. And I know this seems obvious, but sometimes um, when you read the Arbitration Act in the context of a specific case, new things kind of jump out at you. So the first uh, policy consideration is fairness. The court may extend the time for delivery of, of an award even after it has been expired. That's section 39 of the Ontario Act. And why might this act, this, this section be very important? Sometimes arbitration agreements set out uh, a date for delivery of the award. And if the arbitrator takes on the arbitration in that context, the arbitrator has an obligation to meet that deadline. And sometimes things come up which prevent that. For example, the arbitrator gets sick. Um, if it may be that the parties don't no until close to the date or even after the date has expired that the arbitrator will not be delivering the award within the time uh, agreed upon and, and there is an unfairness in then preventing the parties from from um, enforcing that award simply because the arbitrator would not or could not um, uh, deliver the award and this provides the party and sometimes the arbitrator in certain rules from requesting an extension of time even after the time has has uh, has has elapsed. Now, this issue raises a whole bunch of questions, such as whether the jurisdiction of the arbitrator um, is gone if the arbitrator delivers the award late pursuant to the terms of the arbitration agreement um, and under the terms of some of the rules. I, I'm not going to go into those uh, to into those complexities, but something to to definitely be be aware of. Another fairness consideration is the right to challenge the arbitrator for bias, and this is under Section 13. As and I've as said, it's also dealt with in all the institutional rules. So the criteria under the uh, Ontario Act is there must be a reasonable apprehension of, apprehension of bias in some of the other acts there is uh, an allegation that the arbitrator does not have the necessary, the arbitrator is, um, is, is uh, there are justifiable doubts as to the independent, to the arbitrator's independence or uh, impartiality. In Ontario, the, the applicant must also show um, in the alternative that the arbitrator does not have the necessary qualifications agreed to by the parties. So the arbitrator can be disqualified for alleged bias or for not having the qualifications. The challenge under the Ontario Act goes to the arbitrator first within a specific period of time, and that period of time may be different under different acts, and it may be different, and the process may be different under different institutional rules. Once faced with the challenge, the arbitrator may either resign or both parties may actually agree to remove, remove the arbitrator. If neither of those occurs, the arbitrator hears the, the, the challenge. And you can imagine some of the interesting issues that can take place behind closed doors if there is a challenge of just one member of a three uh, member tribunal. And in some cases that will result in uh, one member of the tribunal resigning without the need for a hearing. The tribunal decides and then if a party is not satisfied with that outcome, under the Ontario Act, a party may go to the court within 10 days and to have the court decide the matter. And the arbitration continues while that application is before the court. And one of the reasons uh, for that, in my view, is it discourages tactical uh, challenges to delay proceedings. The model law 
uses the justifiable doubts test. And again, the challenge goes to the arbitrator unless the parties agree otherwise, usually by their choice of institutional rules. And if, again, the court will have a jurisdiction to decide uh, the issue if one of the parties is not satisfied with the outcome. The BC Domestic Act actually has a higher threshold for the disqualification of an arbitrator. It uses the justifiable doubts test, but in order to succeed, there must be a real danger of bias on the part of the arbitrator. Must be a real danger of bias as, to a, as opposed to a showing that the circumstances may give rise to justifiable doubts. And I understand that that higher threshold was introduced because of the rising number of challenges to arbitrators for tactical reasons. Because the case law and, and institutional history show that while the number of challenges is increasing, the uh, successful challenges remain uh, uh, very low in number. Another example of fairness, the termination of the arbitrator's mandate or removal of the arbitrator, which can be done by the court. By the court. Sometimes when the, the challenge of the arbitrator is successful, or if the arbitrator is unable to perform their functions, commits a corrupt or fraudulent act, delays unduly in conducting the arbitration, or the arbitration is not conducted in accordance with fairness. And where you usually see this is again, the arbitrator is sick and just can't seem to get the award out or uh, the, there are long delays in the arbitral process, sometimes because the arbitrator is too busy to deal with the arbitration on a timeline that the parties would like. Sometimes it happens when the arbitrator is simply taking too long to issue an award. And although there's no specific requirement in the arbitration uh, agreement that the award be delivered by a certain date, the parties have an interest usually driven by business considerations, which uh, require a, a, an award to be delivered uh, within a certain period of time. And the arbitrator just simply has has not met that. And that clearly uh, relates to a, a fairness issue. Um, and again, the court has the jurisdic jurisdiction to, to intervene. The court um, in, in terminating the mandate or, or uh, removing an arbitrator may give directions as to the conduct of the arbitration going, going forward, but shows restraint in, in in exercising its right to remove an arbitrator or terminate the mandate, because obviously that is inconsistent with the, the party's desire for efficiency and finality. So this is essentially something that gets ordered on a worst case scenario. Only the penalty made by the court may be appealed by the arbitrator or, or, a, or a party to the Ontario Court of Appeal with leave. And there is an interesting question about what happens once the arbitrator has been terminated or, or removed or, or their mandate has been terminated, because in some instances, that may mean that the arbitration can continue nonetheless before a new arbitrator. And that arbitrator will be appointed in the same way as the original arbitrator was, either by, by the par parties or pursuant some, to some appointment process driven either by the court or by the, uh, the institutional rules. But it may be in some situations that the arbitration itself must terminate. So, for example, if the arbitration agreement stipulates that a particular arbitrator must stand in that role, that arbitrator is then removed the arbitration, unless the parties wish to constitute uh, with a new arbitrator, may end. And whether that occurs or not is stipulated by the language in particular of the arbitration agreement. Now, if the arbitration proceeds, then the question is on what basis? Um, if it's a sole arbitrator, will the arbitrator start from scratch? Will the arbitrator look at the transcripts from the proceeding and look at the evidence and continue on? Uh, and the same considerations uh, are, are relevant to when, when a single member of a tribunal is, is replaced. So if you're seeking such an order, you've got to give consideration to the practical implications of the order that, that you're seeking. And again, we can see the opportunity for tactical motions to be brought um, in order to delay or subvert the process. Another um, fairness consideration is 
is uh, the entitlement to obtain interim measures from the court or um, from an institution if the parties have uh, have delegated that role to the institution. And I, as I've said, parties may actually decide and agree in their arbitration agreement that no interim measures may be sought at all. So under Section 8 of the Ontario Act, the, the court's powers are with respect to the detention, preservation and inspection of pro pro property, interim injunctions, and the appoint appointment of receivers, which is the same in arbitrations as in court actions. Very broad right of the court. And essentially that provides concurrent jurisdiction between the, uh, arbitrator, the arbitrator, the panel, and the court in certain circumstances. In Section 18 of the Ontario Act, uh, uh, on a party's request, a tribunal may make an order for the detention, preservation, or inspection of property and documents that are subject of the arbitration, or as to which a question may arise in the arbitration, etc. So the Act specifically sets out that a party may apply to either the court or to the arbitrator for this release, and that the court may enforce the direction of an arbitral tribunal. Under the, on the model law, section, Article 9 also specifically states that there is concurrent jurisdiction. And so Article 9, it's not incompatible with an arbitration agreement for a party to request before or during ar arbitral proceedings for, from a court for an interim measure of protection and for the court to grant that measure. Article 17 sub 2 of the model law sets out the test uh, for the uh, the, the um, interim measure and allows and sets out the specific instances in which that relief may be granted to maintain or restore the, the status quo, to take action that would prevent or refrain from taking action that's likely to cause current or imminent harm, to provide a means of preserving assets, and to, prefer, to preserve evidence. So that is uh, relief that an arbitral tribunal can grant under the model law. Again, the institutional rules may set out different tests for when such relief can be granted, and that relief may be different from the test we know in Canada as the RJR test. Um, and so what this may mean is that a party seeking this relief needs to look to the institutional rules and there may be published uh, um, uh, discussion or even case law about how the institutional rules uh, interpret that test. The um, UNCITRAL model law, for example, contains commentary. And again, as I've said before, party autonomy comes into play because the parties can opt out of a requirement uh, or a, a permission by one of the parties to uh, obtain interim relief. Enforcement of an award. Where a party is not complying with an award, it is possible to seek court enforcement. And one of the one of the wonderful things about the New York Convention in international law is that it permits uh, a party to obtain an enforcement of a, an award uh, in any jurisdiction which is also a signatory to the model law, which is, is a much easier process than applying to uh, a, a foreign court in the court process to uh, for enforcement of an award. And I don't have a lot of time to go into the model law, but you can take a look at it. And the number of signatories is in the hundreds, which means that it's very easy for parties to get awards enforced it in, enforced in multiple jurisdictions. The Ontario court, court also allows a court, that, that court to enforce awards made in Ontario as a, as a, as a as well as awards made elsewhere in Canada. And essentially the, the prohibition, the only prohibitions are that the time for appealing the award has not uh, elapsed. There's a pending application to set aside or appeal the award. Uh, the award has been set aside. In other words, the, the award is not yet final. The set aside uh, application and the enforcement of the award have similar criteria and they are not, they do not involve a review of the merits. They are strictly issues of lack of jurisdiction of the tribunal, excess of jurisdiction of the tribunal or unfairness of the process. That is the focus of that, that relief. And I'm running short of time, so I'm gonna move to 
assistance in taking evidence. Another fairness consideration. The arbitrator can also uh, uh, seek or the party, a party can seek assistance from the court in obtaining evidence necessary for the hearing. So section 29 of the Ontario Act provides that an arbitrator may issue a summons to persons or for documents, which has the same effect as a court notice. So the arbitrator has independent right to issue uh, a summons to persons not involved in the arbitration, and that has the same effect as court notice. However, there may be ne ne need for the court's assistance if the, there are, for example, third parties to the arbitration who won't, uh, won't comply, um, or for example, uh, letters rogatory are necessary to obtain that evidence outside the jurisdiction of the place of the arbitration. So the party or the tribunal may seek an order of the court for directions with respect to the taking of that evidence as if it were a court proceeding. So this is a very a potentially very broad exercise of the court's jurisdiction to assist arbitrations. The model law says that the arbitral tribunal or a party with the approval of the tribunal may request from a competent court of this state in this in this uh, situation, Ontario, assistance in taking evidence, the court may execute the request within its competence and according to its rules on taking evidence, which provides a very broad right of the court to um, assist the court in taking evidence. The, the allowance of a tribunal to seek that relief from the, uh, from, from the court in my experience, it's very rare, and I think it's more likely that parties themselves uh, themselves seek that relief with the uh, with the consent uh, of the of the tribunal. So I'm now going to deal with a couple of instances in the Ontario Act and the Model Law where the court the court intervention is limited because of the concept of party autonomy. So, for example, the most significant of those is. Uh, an application to stay the action in favor of arbitration. So in, in Section 7, 1, 7 1 of the Ontario Arbitration Act, a party to an arbitration agreement who commences a proceeding in respect of a matter that is to be submitted to arbitration, the court in which the proceeding is commenced shall, on the motion of another party to the arbitration agreement, stay the proceeding except in limited circumstances. So the court provides relief where the parties have agreed to submit their disputes to arbitration and one of the parties has commenced a court proceeding. Here are the exceptions. A party entered into the arbitration agreement while under a legal capacity. The arbitration agreement is invalid. The subject matter of the dispute is not capable of being the subject of arbitration under Ontario law. The motion was brought with undue delay. That in itself is a complex issue. And the matter is a proper one for default or summary judgment. And this is an interesting uh, provision and there's actually not a lot of case law on it. It permits the court to refuse the stay motion, if the matter is a proper one for default or summary judgment. And the interesting thing about the case law is that it's conflicting on whether the party seeking the stay must submit sufficient evidence, a motion record, to establish that summary judgment may be granted, and in fact, asking the court to grant summary judgment. So there are some cases in which the court um, expresses the view that the stay ought not to be granted because this is appropriate one for default or summary judgment and there are no summary judgment or merits materials before the court. The court may order either a stay or a partial stay and this may happen for example if the arbitration agreement deals with contract claims but not court claims so the contract claims will proceed by way of arbitration but the court tort claims will proceed by way of court proceedings the court is not to give any consideration to the to the fact that that result may constitute or result in a dupli duplicity or multiplicity of proceedings the arbitration act provides that the 
matter is to be stayed if the issue is to be dealt with by an arbitra arbitrator in accordance with the arbitration agreement. There may also be a partial stay granted where some of the claims involve third party non non signatories, for example, to the arbitration agreement, and the rest of the claims uh, are can be dealt with by the parties to the arbitration agreement. And again, you can see how inconvenient and costly that is for parties who um, are find themselves in that situation, but it's a demonstration of the legislature's commitment to party autonomy. The language with respect to the stay provision differs across the country, and, and but it is similar. So for example, in BC and the model law, in order to avoid a stay, the, the, the um, arbitration agreement is not invalid. It is void, inoperative, and incapable of performance. And, and though the definition of those, uh, those, that language is, 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 can be decided based on contract interpret interpretation principles. And I would argue that the language in the Ontario Act, invalid, uh, encompasses all of those concepts, void, inoperative, and incapable of uh, being performed. And the stay, the test for a stay, assuming it doesn't fall within one of the exceptions, is the arguable, arguable case uh, standard. So if the party can establish that the dispute, it is arguable that the dispute falls within the scope of the arbitration clause and that the, the parties are proper parties to the arbitration, the um, the competence competence principle is evoked and that matter gets determined by the arbitrator. So that's essentially a, a, a jurisdiction issue before the arbitrator. And the only um, exception to that is where it is a question of law that can be determined by the court or the court can determine the jurisdiction question by a superficial review of the record, which is extremely rare. So the legislation is designed to ensure that the, the court interferes as little as possible where the parties have agreed that their uh, dispute is to be resolved by, by arbitration. Appeals is another example of party autonomy, arguably fairness as well. Um, and I'm talking specifically about appeals of the final award. There are other parts in the act and in the model law which refer to a court intervention to decide the matter, for example. Um, and, and I'm not going to get into those specific um, provisions, one of which is where an arbitrator makes a preliminary jurisdiction ruling. I'm going to focus on appeals of final awards. And under on, Ontario uh, Act Section 45, uh, that's the appeal provision. And an appeal revol uh, involves a substantive review of the merits of the award, a detailed review of the evidence and reasons for decision of the arbitrator. If, if the right to appeal is not dealt with in the arbitration agreement, which of course could provide that no appeals are permitted, the act says that the an, an, an appeal may be granted on a question of law with leave, or if the arbitration agreement allows on a question of fact or mixed fact and law. So the parties may provide specifically for appeal, but limit the scope of that appeal. If the appeal is on a question of law, we all know that the Supreme Court of Canada Satva case refers to that as an extricable error of law, which will allow an appeal. And the leave test under the act is the importance to the parties of the matter at stake justifies an appeal and the determination of the question of law will significantly affect the rights of the parties. So important and it affects the outcome. Now, if you've been watching the case law, demonstrating an extricable error of law is extremely difficult and many, many appeals uh, appear, appear in the case law where parties try to show what an extricable area, era of law is and they are rarely able to do so. If an appeal is granted, the court may require the arbitrator to explain any matter or confirm vary or set aside or remit it back to the arbitrator and give directions if the appeal is on a question of law. So the court has broad discretion to decide what should be done in the interests of the parties and the interest of fairness 
to ensure that whatever uh, has justified the appeal can be corrected. And in many cases, it is to send the issue back to the arbitrator with direction on how to proceed uh, with uh, issuing the amended award. The BC Act provides for more limited appeal rights. And again, this is, uh, this is part of the expression of uh, party autonomy because parties can agree to opt in or out of this provision. But there are appeals only on questions of law and only if the parties agree and they grant and the, the Ontario Court of Appeal grants leave. So it's an opt-in jurisdiction. Appeals are not permitted, permitted in international arbitration under the model law. And the only recourse uh, against an award in international uh, arbitration is to have it set aside on fairness or jurisdiction grounds. I'm next going to talk about efficiency. What, what uh, areas um, uh, uh, can the court, uh, court's assistance be invoked for efficiency reasons. The first, of course, is appointment of an arbitral arbitrator or tribunal. If the parties have not provided a process for appointment of an arbitrator or tribunal, and they can't agree upon one, and they have not agreed upon rules which provide for a process, the court uh, may be accessed in order to do so. And an application may be brought for the appointment of a tribunal and essentially that occurs when the parties can't agree or where the arbitra arbitration agreement provides for each of the parties to do something. For example, in uh, the appointment of a three-person tribunal, if both people are supposed to suggest someone and one of the parties doesn't suggest a party appointee, then the court's assistance may be invoked. And there is no appeal from the court's appointment of the tribunal. Similar right applies under the model law, Article 11, and there are time limits for seeking this relief. Another area where the court may intervene for efficiency reasons is consolidation of arbitrations under Section 8 sub 4, ordering that they be uh, that the arbitrations take place simultaneously or consecutively or that one arbitration be uh, stayed to allow the others to proceed. We know that those are rights that are um, permissible uh, in court proceedings, and, and that right is actually very limited in arbitral proceedings. Um, for example, the court cannot order consolidation unless all of the parties uh, are before the court the court and agree. So the, the important um, funda fundamental principle is that the court on an application of parties for one arbitration cannot uh, grant relief that will affect non-present parties in another arbitration. So there may be a dispute, for example, among the various parties about whether the proceeding should be consolidated or one should happen one before the other. The court can be invoked in order to resolve that process. Again, for case management reasons, efficiency reasons. And finally, uh, finality. The, um, the most obvious instance of that is a limitation period for the enforcement of an award. The, the section 52 sub three of the Ontario Arbitration Act says that parties have 10 years to apply to enforce an, an award from the date the order was received or the set aside application was decided. That's easy. I think that the idea of applications to set aside an award are also consistent with the finality principle because they allow for parties to understand that there will be no review of the merits of an appeal, uh, like there is in an appeal of an award, which has the potential then of course to go to uh, from the trial level court then to an appellate court Court and possibly up to the Supreme Court of Canada, they must agree um, under the Ontario, sorry, under the international law, um, they have their only recourse is a set aside. And although in Ontario and the other provincial jurisdictions, appeals are available, uh, they, they, the set aside right also exists. And a set aside is like, a, a, is, can be obtained on the same grounds as an as enforcement of award. So again, a set aside may be obtained where the arbitrator lacks jurisdiction, exercises an excess of jurisdiction, or there's a lack of procedure procedural fairness. So what this means is that 
parties who either buy in to the set aside um, application alone or are required to do so under the legislation understand that the arbitrator may be wrong but what they what they are entitled to is a fair process and a lot of domestic arbitration counsel find, find this a surprising um surprising idea that there's no appeal right but it's one of the things that is that many parties find is attractive in arbitration and so this is consistent with this principle of finality the issue that arises often is when we're talking about an error of law, is that a matter that is an appealable error, error or is that an error that, error that is to be dealt with on a set-aside application? And there's no clear answer to that. Um, it's, it's very difficult to, to um, and, the, and the, the, the case law isn't clear. So when you're unsure, I think that the solution as counsel is to bring both an appeal uh, and a set-aside application. But I think the, the best answer, um, and the one that I think you'll find the weight of authority on, is that an error of jurisdiction is not an error of law. And so I think that makes good intuitive sense. It makes good principled sense. But ingenious counsel can often think of ways to turn jurisdiction issues into uh, legal issues. And we see that quite often in the case law. My next session is September the 19th at noon. We are almost out of time and I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. Um, I haven't yet decided on the topic for the December 19th session. I do have a few ideas. Um, contact me again uh, if you have an idea of something you'd like to, to hear about. Um, and in the meantime, enjoy your summer and I'll see you in September. Have a great day.